And otherwise, welcome to our satellite event by, by Bitbond. I'm Radoslav Albrecht, I'm the founder and CEO of Bitbond, and I'm very happy to see you here today. And today we want to talk about the blockchain as a layer for financial services and what it does, why we discuss it at all, and what advantages it can potentially bring. If you have questions, feel free to ask them throughout the talk. Um, we plan to do the event for roughly an hour, including your questions. It might drag on for a little longer, but that's uh, up to you, of course. But if you have questions, feel free to ask them throughout the talk. So, let's get started. Um, why, why do we look at blockchain as a technology and what could it help us in financial services? The great thing is that blockchain is a technology that lets service providers provide financial services independently of banks. And that is something that's quite revolutionary, as we will see throughout the talk. Now, if you look at the banking industry and if you want to innovate in the banking industry, as a startup, you typically face two challenges. One is the infrastructure that you need in order to run financial services, especially as soon as you start touching payments. It gets really expensive. So you either need your own infrastructure, but even if you rent it from an established financial service firm, it's still expensive. And the other obstacle that you face is regulation. Typically, most of the financial services that are out there are heavily regulated, which means that you need a license, or if you don't want to get the license yourself, again, you need to rent it from somebody, which again costs you some money. So these are the obstacles that you face. But nevertheless, even though we have these two hurdles, there's quite a lot of fintech startups already. This chart is showing the homepage of Wells Fargo, one of the largest US banks. And on the homepage, they list all kinds of services they provide. And this chart shows a, a dozen, dozens of startup logos that are disrupting each and every of these services that Wells Fargo is providing. So most of these startups don't provide a universal bank experience like Wells Fargo does, but they just pick one small part of their value chain and provide it better, more efficiently, and most of the time, more user-friendly. So even though we have these obstacles, there already is quite a lot of innovation. However, most of these startups are just, in inverted commas, just a new front end. These are just three examples. If you look at number 26, number 26, I think, provides a great user experience. Um, uh, I think it's, I, I really like that startup. However, in the background, you have Wirecard Bank. Number 26 today isn't their own bank. They are a very well-made front end to a banking service that's effectively provided by Wirecard Bank. And even if number 26 gets their own banking license, they will probably still be using a partner or they will have to build the infrastructure themselves, which doesn't make it much cheaper. So even if number 26 stays the way they are with their own banking infrastructure, it will still be expensive. If you look at Aux Money, which is the largest German peer-to-peer -peer lending platform, they work with SV Karma. Again, the service is great, and it's, it's, it's a really well-made platform, they're really successful, they're doing really well. However, they need a banking partner in the background, both for the infrastructure reason and also for regulatory reasons, because the service that they provide, which effectively is loans and investment, is a regulatory service in Germany. If you look at Wealthfront, which is a robo-advisor based in the US, also a great startup, I really like it, the service that they provide is great. But the assets that they give you access to are pretty traditional stocks, ETFs, mutual funds. So again, it's, it's, it's a great service, but it's not a huge step forward. It's an improvement in the user experience, but in the background there is still a lot of legacy going on. Why is that? The reason is that banks run on infrastructure and software that's pretty outdated. This is a room with, with mainframe computers, they run on COBOL programming language, and SWIFT is one of the leading ways to conduct international payments. So it's pretty hard to get out of this vicious circle, I would always call it, because even if you provide a nice new front end, you're still stuck with this old technology. And it's expensive, it's not made for the web, and that slows processes down 
no matter how innovative you are as a startup. Now, let's introduce blockchain technology into this field and let's see what it can do for us. Now, first of all, I want to give a bit of an explanation what blockchain technology actually is. And in order to understand what blockchain is, in my view, it's great to start with Bitcoin, which is sort of the mother of blockchains, because block, uh, Bitcoin uh, basically invented, and the Bitcoin inventor invented the blockchain. And all other blockchains, all other digital currencies that you see are a derivative of the Bitcoin protocol. The other reason why we start with looking at Bitcoin today is because it's still the by far most relevant blockchain technology. Look at the market cap, Bitcoin has around ten and a half billion dollars market cap. The next second biggest blockchain slash digital currency is Ethereum, which has around about one billion dollars market cap, so it's roughly one tenth of Bitcoin. And also the number of nodes, we will see what that actually is, is, uh, is smaller than with Bitcoin. And the number of daily transactions that are being conducted on the Bitcoin blockchain are significantly higher with roughly 230,000 daily transactions at the moment versus around about 25% on the Ethereum blockchain. So Bitcoin, in terms of traction, is still by far the most relevant digital currency and blockchain technology. Also, if you look at search volume on Google Trends, Bitcoin, which is the blue line here, it's still receiving the highest number of search queries versus blockchain and Ethereum being well below that. So what does, what does Bitcoin do? And what is the blockchain? The blockchain is actually a byproduct of Bitcoin. The inventor of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto, he didn't really think about the blockchain a lot in terms of I'm inventing a blockchain. What he wanted to do, according to what he said, was create a digital cash. And in order to create digital cash, the blockchain became a byproduct that allowed him to do it. What is the problem that you face when you want to create digital cash? The problem is that digital assets are inflationary. If you take MP3 files, if you take text files, if you take image files, when I own, let's say, an MP3 file and I recorded a song that has a lot of demand because people love the song, then I could sell this mp3 file for, I don't know, let's say two euros and then I don't have any control whether this file gets distributed over the internet an infinite number of times. Therefore, if we wanted to use this mp3 file as a currency, which obviously does have value, it still wouldn't be a good currency and a good uh, representative of digital cash just because it's inflationary. It can be copied over and over again without anybody's control. So Satoshi Nakamoto, the inventor of Bitcoin, invented the blockchain. And the blockchain is a distributed public ledger where all the transactions that are happening in Bitcoin are recorded and are publicly visible. Now let's take an easy example. Let's say I own one unit of digital cash. Let's say it's Bitcoin. All of you can look up in the internet what is my account balance. You don't necessarily know my identity that's behind that account balance, but if you know my account number, which is called the Bitcoin address in Bitcoin, then you will see how much Bitcoin I own. And now let's say I own one Bitcoin. Everybody knows that. And I conduct one transaction where I transfer this whole Bitcoin to another person, let's say to Chris over here. So I own zero Bitcoin now and Chris owns the one Bitcoin that I used to have. All of you could see that transaction happen. All of you could look it up in the blockchain, in this distributed public ledger. And if I wanted to do a second transaction of another Bitcoin, let's say, nobody of you would accept that transaction because you would tell me, hey, you've already done your transaction, the Bitcoin is gone, we don't accept any more money from you because it's fake. So that's the clue about the blockchain, making transactions visible. And at the end of the day, that makes the blockchain a database, right? It's nothing else than just storing data with the huge advantage that everything is public. Now, this is a screenshot of blockchain.info, which is also call, called a block explorer. So this is where you can look up blockchain transactions. So here we've got a 
Bitcoin address. It's probably hard to read because it's a pretty long string of numbers and letters. But you can see the balance and what was the total of received transactions on that address. So you can see and look up every single transaction that happened on that address. And if you know other addresses, you can look that up as well. So the great thing about this, it makes the transactions trustless because I'm not just claiming that I have one Bitcoin. You can actually look it up and verify the fact that I actually own that money that I claim to have. And that's what's also making the transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain and also on other similar blockchains trustless. Now, how do new Bitcoins get generated? This is something that people are often really interested in. I'm just summarizing it really briefly because we could do just an entire session on mining on its own. So, when new Bitcoins are generated, because somehow the Bitcoins have to come into existence, there's a process involved that's called Bitcoin mining. And it's, it's literally something that's really similar to, for example, gold mining. You need to put up resources and you need, to, you need to put up some effort in order to receive Bitcoins as a reward. And right now, 12 and a half Bitcoins are generated on average every 10 minutes as a reward for the miners who have conducted this. Mining at the end of the day is a game of chance. Imagine you have a dice and your task is to throw a six 10 times in a row. Then if you have one dice, it might take you multiple hours to do that. Now imagine you have a hundred dices at the same time. Then your probability that you complete this task of throwing six, uh, ten sixes in a row is much higher. And that's basically what Bitcoin mining is. The more hardware power you have, the higher is the probability that you get a mining reward quicker. And that leads to the fact that there's a lot of mining farms around the world and they're increasing the hardware power. And the great thing about that is that at the same time the Bitcoin network becomes more resilient and much, much harder to hack. If you combine all the supercomputers that exist around the world, the computational power would still be lower than the combined hashing power of the Bitcoin network. Now, that's one thing what mining does. It creates new tokens, new currency units, Bitcoins in the case of Bitcoin. The other thing that mining does is it confirms transactions. So when I do this Bitcoin transaction, from me to Chris that I have just used as an example, somebody needs to engrave that transaction into the blockchain because somehow it needs to enter this public ledger, the blockchain. And that's what the miners do in parallel to the mining process. So the miners, from an infrastructure perspective, are a crucial part of the blockchain. And the blockchain could not exist without a process like mining or something similar that makes sure that, that the transactions actually end up being recorded in that public ledger. Now, the blockchain, as we said, can also be regarded as a database, right? It's storing all the transactions that happen. And I said that one advantage of the blockchain is that it's trustless because everybody can look up the transactions. Now, there is a second advantage besides being trustless, and the second advantage is that it's distributed. Since the blockchain is a public ledger, there's a lot of copies around it. And right now, in the Bitcoin blockchain, there's around about 6,000 copies distributed around the world that store the Bitcoin blockchain. And these dots on this map are nodes, as they are called. The nodes are basically running the full version of the Bitcoin protocol and store the Bitcoin blockchain. And the Bitcoin blockchain, by the way, by now is a pretty big database. It's already around 80 gigabytes of data, and it's growing every second when there is a new transaction added to this transaction ledger. Now, when Bitcoin started out, a lot of people were just talking about Bitcoin as a currency because it was increasing in value a lot. Nowadays, the media attention has shifted a lot to blockchain. And we'll talk about uh, a number of different interesting blockchain applications today. However, one thing, in my view, is quite important to keep in mind that the media nowadays often ignores is that the blockchain and the token, Bitcoin, are two sides of one coin, so to speak. 
because the blockchain is a distributed public ledger. It would not exist if there wasn't a financial incentive to keep it running. And therefore, Bitcoin and the blockchain, or the blockchain and the Ether, which is the currency on the Ethereum blockchain, they can't be separated. You can't have just a database, because this database would be very insecure if there wasn't a strong financial incentive for a lot of parties around the world to actually keep the network running. So that's very important to keep in mind that these two things go together hand in hand. Now, throughout the rest of the talk, uh, I would want to go through a number of applications that can be done based on blockchain. And typically, they can be categorized into one of these three categories. The first is, since every blockchain needs a token, there's always also an asset. The token has a price and it can be traded on markets. And people can simply speculate on an increase in price, they can short it and bet on a decrease in price. So that's a very simple functionality, but that's one of the functionalities that at the start of a new token typically receives the highest amount of attention because it's really simple and you can observe the price going up or down. Then we have applications that are taking advantage <coughs> of the payment network that's running on every blockchain. And then we have applications that are taking advantage of the protocol function that every blockchain also has got. So let's look at the asset first and we just take Bitcoin as an example here. So Bitcoin right now trades around about $600 and it's a relatively volatile currency. If you look at the euro versus the dollar, which is the most liquid currency pair around the world. The annualized volatility of, of daily changes between the dollar and the euro exchange rate is typically around about 8%. Sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower, but that's roughly the value. If you look at the volatility of the Bitcoin price versus the dollar, then you see that the volatility is typically around 20, sometimes even 60 or 80%. So it's significantly higher. However, it's trending down. A couple of years ago, it was well above 100% on an annualized volatility basis. So the volatility is going down. However, it's still relatively high. And therefore, if you look at Bitcoin and other digital currencies as an asset, they are pretty risky assets. They have a high volatility. And typically, it makes only sense for people to trade with it who hopefully know what they are doing and who are definitely aware of the risks that they are taking when they take a position in a digital currency. So that was Bitcoin and digital currencies and, and blockchain applications as an asset. Now, in the next part of the talk, I would like to present some applications that take advantage of blockchain and the attached payment network. And we're basically looking at Bitcoin-related payment applications, just because, as we've seen at the beginning of the talk, Bitcoin is by far the most liquid and by far the digital currency with the highest number of users and the highest uh, traction. Now, why, why would somebody provide financial services actually based on top of Bitcoin? We didn't really touch that yet. Now, there's a number of advantages. First of all, it's open and permissionless. If you want to connect yourself to the SWIFT network, there's a lot of hurdles that you need to take. You cannot just turn on your computer and say I'm connecting to the SWIFT network right now and because I need payments in the application and in the service that I want to provide. Bitcoin is open and permissionless. You can turn on your computer, download the software and connect yourself to the network every minute when you have a connection to the internet. So it's open and permissionless and that's one huge advantage of it. And second, it's programmable. So Bitcoin and also other digital currencies basically have an API where you can run your code and connect to the network not just with withdrawals and deposits, but you also you can execute code and you can basically talk to the to the blockchain via an API. It's trustless, we've already discussed that, since the transactions are publicly visible. It's third party independent, which is one other huge advantage. As we have seen with the example of number 26, they are not third party independent. They need a banking partner. If you provide an application where you use Bitcoin or Ethereum or Litecoin for your payments, you don't need any third parties. You can create your own code and run it and don't need anybody else to ask for permission 
and to, or to pay them a fee for the service. Then it's cost effective. If you send a Bitcoin transaction from one person to the other, regardless of the size of the transaction, regardless of whether the Bitcoins are worth just one dollar, a hundred dollars, a million dollars, the fees that are paid for these transactions are always almost equally low, around about one cent. And that makes it really, really cost effective. And then at the same time, it's global and really fast. If I set a Bitcoin transaction right now, it arrives at the receiver's device, whether it's a phone, a desktop computer, within a matter of seconds. The experience is really as if you were sending an email. While if you send a wire transfer, the experience is more like sending a letter, right? It takes multiple days, and the further the receiver is, the more expensive it gets. I just recently wired an uh, amount of money from Germany to the US. Both are countries that have really developed uh, banking, banking markets, but the transaction cost 45 euros for a transaction that had a value of around about 2,000 euros, right? So that's a really high percentage. And with Bitcoin, again, the fees are low and the transactions are conducted immediately, while the wire transfer to the US, I think, took four or five days to complete. Now, the other good thing is that Bitcoin as a technology integrates really well into a tech stack that web developers are super familiar with nowadays. So technologies like Ruby or like Python even, or basically any other popular programming language can talk to the Bitcoin protocol really well. There's a lot of well-developed libraries. And, and all the typical application stack that you run when you, when you do a web app or a mobile app can talk to Bitcoin really conveniently. And this is, this is not true to the traditional banking system. However, what you also need to consider is that all these technical details do not need to be understood by the end user. When you serve the internet, when you go to Amazon, for example, you also don't think about the HTTPS protocol that's the underlying technology that lets you serve an internet website. Most people around the world use the internet with their phones, with their desktop computers, and never think about the underlying protocol. And also, why should they, right? They need a service, they have a need that they want to fulfill, and they don't want to think about the underlying technology all the time. Otherwise, we could not live the way we live today if we needed to understand every single technology that we're using throughout the day. Even the car is quite a complex application today, and uh, I don't think a lot of people would understand how a car works in every detail. And the same is true for Bitcoin applications as well. If you just want to use it as an end user, the underlying technology doesn't really have to matter to you as long as the service that gets provided to you is significantly better. So today, obviously, we talk a bit about the technology, but what's important to keep in mind, if you start using some of the services that are provided on top of the Bitcoin blockchain, the Ethereum blockchain, or any others, they already today tend to be so good that there isn't a lot of need to understand a lot of the technology that's running under the hood. So let's look at some payment-related applications. So the first and most obvious one are remittances. If you need to send money abroad and the other person doesn't have a bank account, one of the services that you would typically use is called Western Union. You need to fill out a lot of different fields on such a form. It takes a long time until the money arrives and the fees can go up to 25% of the transaction. So it's really, really expensive. Now if you use Bitcoin, and you want to send money to somebody, all you need to do is scan a QR code, which represents the Bitcoin address where you're sending the money to, and that's it. It's fast, the money gets there within a number of seconds, and it's cheap. The transactions run about one cent. So remittances are one really obvious use case of the Bitcoin blockchain, because it's simple and it's really efficient. Now, another application is what we run at Bitbond. Bitbond is the first global marketplace lending platform for small business loans. And it's not like there weren't other providers of small business loans. Cabbage is a really big platform in the US. They are really successful. And in the US and the UK, they provide a really great service. However, they are only limited to these two countries. And a lot of other countries around the world don't have providers that are specializing on small business loans. It's really, really tough around the world to get a loan if you run a small business. And we at Bitcoin, we created a global platform where no matter where you're coming from, as long as you have access to the internet, you can get a loan or you can invest your money into the loans of other people. 
And that's something that's really revolutionary because by that, a lot of people who don't even have access to formal financial services can invest their money and can get a loan. Around about 56% of the global adult population doesn't have a bank account. And in about two to three years, the internet penetration will surpass the penetration of bank accounts. And there's a lot of people around the world who will probably never even get a traditional bank account just because they have access to the internet. And they may have access to blockchain-based services that simply don't even bother using traditional means of payment and traditional bank accounts. Another application for payments is related to merchants. If you're a merchant and you run an online shop and you want to accept payments on your shop because you're selling goods, then often you would integrate a credit card processor, for example. Now, the disadvantage of that is that the fees are really high. Typically, they are 2 to 4% of the transaction. And it takes quite some time, up to a couple of weeks, until the merchant actually receives the money from the credit card provider. Now, if you want to accept Bitcoin as a means of payment, you can either do it entirely independently of third parties, or you could also use payment processes like Coinbase or BitPay. And the reason to do that is to get rid of the exchange rate volatility of Bitcoin. If you accept payments via Coinbase or BitPay, they can pay out the amount that the buyer per, uh, uh, paid on your platform directly in your local currency. And they do it cheaper, they do it for 1% of the transaction value, and they do it much quicker. Typically, they disburse the money within a matter of a few days. So accepting payments in Bitcoin as a merchant is something that's highly advantageous versus other payment methods where the fees tend to be much higher. Now, these were the payment-related applications of blockchain. Now, let's look at other applications that can potentially and that potentially are already really interesting. Now, as I said at the beginning, there's a lot of media hype about this term blockchain. And I really like this cartoon because it highlights what we should always keep in mind. I don't know if everybody can read it. I will read what it says in the bubbles. At the beginning, here's a meeting room. And this guy says, all our competitors, banks, have blockchain labs. I want one too. So there's a banker and he says, but everybody is looking at this blockchain technology. Let's also do something with it. We can't stay behind. We have to follow up with our competitors. And now one says, yeah, we'll need some block spurs. Yeah, so we need people who are experts in blockchain technology. Great. Then the other person says, and we need to have a hipster office. So let's redesign our office so we look more hip than the traditional banks. Now here's the third guy, and he's the, he's the bad guy here. He says, and now we also need a real customer problem to solve with that technology. <laughs> And then he gets thrown out of the window. <laughs> because nobody's interested in a real customer problem. They just want to jump on the hype and use a technology that apparently everybody is looking at. And that's something that's really to be kept in mind. It's not actually about the technology. The technology is nice and great. But it actually only provides value if we solve real customer problems with it. And that's something that we should always be looking at can we provide a better service with the technology? Because if not, then there's no real reason to actually move away from the legacy systems that we have. So what, what are blockchain applications? How can they be? So typically, they are using a feature that's called colored coins. Normally, if you have a Bitcoin, every Bitcoin is created equal. So I don't care whether I get a Bitcoin from Chris or from Christian. It will be the same type of thing, even though it's a different Bitcoin. The functionality and the features of this Bitcoin will be equal. However, that doesn't have to be the case always. There can be a thing that's called colored coins. And those are Bitcoin tokens that have additional features. And these additional features are possible because of the fact that when I do a Bitcoin or an Ethereum transaction, it's not just a record of the transaction that says, one Bitcoin went from one address to the other, but there can be additional information attached to it that is then engraved into the blockchain. So it could, for example, just send a message like hello world. So if I send my token from my wallet to Chris' wallet, I could attach a message to it and tell him, hey Chris, how are you doing? So that's one very simple application that would almost be like a messenger. I could also say I'm one BMW share. 
So I could actually attach another asset to that token, which could be a share, it could be something that represents a physical object in the, in the real world. So there could be other things attached to these tokens, and they could even run code, which means we could have an if-then statement. So if x equals y, then please do that. So we could observe the world around us, and if some conditions apply, we could actually execute code that's already engraved on the blockchain and that can be observed by everybody but that cannot be changed by anybody. Now, we've talked a lot about Bitcoin and we've talked a lot about Ethereum and that's because, again, these are currently the by far most uh, widely used blockchain applications. Now, Bitcoin was primarily used and created to be a payment network. The inventor, Satoshi Nakamoto of Bitcoin, he wanted to create digital cash. The protocol functionality where you can do other things with that Bitcoin transaction is almost a byproduct that probably was not his primary objective. So if we run protocol applications on top of the Bitcoin blockchain, they might not be super efficient. It's possible, however, there's a couple of technological disadvantages. Like, for example, if you want to find a colored coin on the Bitcoin blockchain uh, that's on a transaction that's way in the past and it's pretty hard to find it and it could take a long number of seconds or even minutes to actually find that transaction. So the Bitcoin blockchain is not really efficient for these types of applications. However, Ethereum was created and Ethereum picked up on this idea to attach other things to those transactions and it was specifically built with the fact and the, the idea in mind that we could run a lot of different things and take advantage of the distributed public ledger that the blockchain is. And there is a Turing complete programming language that's running on Ethereum, it's called Solidity and it can do something like a smart contract. So what I've shown on the previous slide where you have an if-then statement engraved in the blockchain. It's like a small script, like a small piece of code that's executed <coughs> on the blockchain, and that's what the Solidity programming language does. So that would be a small, smart contract that's running on top of the Ethereum blockchain. And Ethereum is done in a really efficient way for these types of applications. Now, if you look at, if you look at different blockchains, there is one thing that, uh, that's also quite interesting to keep in mind. You want to know how reliable is the blockchain and how well is the technology made. And you also want to know how much trust is actually required. And if you look at Bitcoin, it's up in the top left corner. It's very stable and mature because it's running for uh, over six years now. And it's completely trustless because, as we have seen, there's over 6,000 nodes distributed around the world that have the Bitcoin blockchain stored. So to change something in the Bitcoin blockchain is nearly impossible. However, if you, on the other hand, have Ethereum, for example, it's also trustless because it's also got a couple of thousand nodes already. However, it's not yet as stable. Ethereum was just released a couple of months ago and if you run an Ethereum node, for example, or if you run smart contracts on top of Ethereum, you will see that from a programming perspective, it's really well made, <coughs> however, it's not yet fully stable, which is also normal for, for young software, right? If you have been involved in a software project yet, uh, you will probably be aware that at the beginning, software tends to be buggy, and you simply need to use it for a certain amount of time until it becomes really scalable and until it really works well. So that's where Ethereum roughly stands today. And then there are other blockchains, and there are more private blockchains. So for example, there is a consortium of banks in the US that's called R3, and they are running their own token on top of the Ethereum blockchain, and it's permissioned. So all of us could not participate in the R3 network because they, need, they would need to grant us permission to it. So it's, you could also compare it to Swift, for example, where you need permission in order to use it. And banks, obviously, they are not really keen on having a public transaction ledger that is open to everybody 
because that takes away some of the fees that they are earning, right? So they are trying to come up with solutions that are taking advantage of, of the speediness and of the cost efficiency of blockchain, but at the same time, they want to come up with entry barriers in order to have an option to take fees for getting access to their network. And if you have blockchains that are not public, it means at the same time that they require a lot of trust. Because you don't have these thousands of nodes that store a copy of the blockchain, but I think right now R3 has around about 50 banks that are participating in that network. So these banks really need to trust each other because if, let's say, 26 banks uh, collided and agreed on something, they could trick the other remaining 24 banks. So, and that's much easier, it's much easier to coordinate 26 entities than to coordinate, I don't know, 3,000 entities. So the smaller the, the network gets, the higher the level of trust that you need uh, becomes. So that's something to keep in mind when you look at different types of blockchain applications. Um, now let's look at uh, some categories on <coughs> blockchain applications. Um, we will later look at two or three other examples from these, but this is sort of an overview of what we can think of today. And the first thing is a static registry. So imagine you conduct a contract with somebody today. And the contract is, I'm delivering you a pack of rice every day for the next 10 days, and you pay me 10 euros for the pack of rice every day. It's a really simple contract for 10 days. Now, we put that on a piece of paper, and now we meet two days later, and we disagree on the content of the contract. Because the other partner was fraudulent, he simply created a new version of the contract, and he's showing me a piece of paper that's not the original one. It's really hard for me to prove that that's not the original piece of paper. So contracts can become fraudulent. However, if we engraved that contract on the blockchain, if we engraved it in this public ledger, where we know nobody can alter it after the fact, then we could always say, okay, hey, look, we've got the contract on the blockchain, it's registered there, and we both know that this is what we agreed upon. And then the contract cannot be altered anymore. So it could ultimately replace notary services, for example. And there is a startup, Bitproof, that uh, it's quite fascinating, that's providing exactly that at a really simple, and low entry level. And identity information is, is one other potential application where there's also already startups working on a solution. If you, <laughs> if you sign up with a service like Google, for example, or there's a lot of other services obviously on the internet where you need to provide identity information, then all of these services have your identity information stored centrally on their servers. And that's something that's basically putting the control of your identity out of your hands. Because these third parties that own identity information about you could use it in a fraudulent way. And if they don't do it, somebody else might do it who hacked their database and got access to your information. And there are startups that are trying to create applications where you have control over your identity data and where you can grant and refuse access to that data via the blockchain. Another application are smart contracts, something that I've mentioned previously a little bit, uh, where you can run and execute code that depends on the state of the world. Um, these could be financial contracts, so if the price of asset X goes beyond a certain threshold, then pay out something. So that's something that's really uh, coming close to a derivative contract. And uh, you don't need to run these derivatives on private databases and banks but you can run them publicly, which makes them more efficient and which makes them more accessible. And you can have a dynamic registry where you don't just have a contract, which would be a static thing, but you can actually transfer um, contracts from one entity to another. That's basically what a stock is. When you own a stock of a publicly listed company and you are an owner and you have this ownership title of that company, but you could also transfer the value of this stock that you own to somebody else if you wanted to sell it. And then you wouldn't need to go 
to a centralized exchange like the London Stock Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange, but you could do it in a peer-to-peer -peer transaction via the blockchain, which could again make it more accessible and it could make it more cost-effective. And then the last thing is uh, uh, verifiable data, and that's also getting a bit close to this uh, to this registry thing. Let's say you created a a piece of visual art or a song, so something that can be stored in a file. You can verify that you were the creator of that piece and of this of this object also on the blockchain. So there is a startup, for example, that's called Ascribe, that's doing exactly that. So this is, this is like an overview of the type of blockchain applications that are being run. Most of these are really at experimental state. So there isn't a lot of applications that have come to a big scale. However, there's a lot of startups that are experimenting in this field. And a couple of them already work quite well. Uh, so for example, Bitproof, what I just mentioned, uh, this registry, it's something that's, in, that's functioning already now. So you can go on bitproof.io and register whatever you want on the blockchain. And it doesn't take more than a minute. And that's something that can really replace the way we conduct contracts today. Now, the other thing that we could do is um, we could do something that's called a distributed or decentralized autonomous organization. I don't know if you all have heard of the DAO, as it's called. So the, the name is a little bit confusing, because DAO is also a generic term for decentralized autonomous organization, but at the same time there was a first really big implementation of a DAO, which is called the DAO, so don't be confused by the name. And the DAO is basically a venture capital fund that collected money from the public through a token sale, the DAO token, which is running on top of the Ethereum blockchain, and they collected a vast amount of money, 160 million dollars. And the market cap, so the, the market price of this organization at, at times was above 220 million dollars. And it, by that was probably the largest crowdfunding campaign that was ever run. However, as we said earlier, the Ethereum blockchain is not yet perfect. And unfortunately, there was a hacker who exploited the fact that the Ethereum blockchain and the smart contracts that are running on top of it are not yet perfect. And he was able to get, uh, doesn't say the concrete amount here, I think it's around about $60 million of that crowd sale. He managed to get into his wallet by exploiting a vulnerability and the way the smart contracts of the DAO were constructed. And this shows us that on the one hand, there's huge projects that can be run with this technology, which is the good part. The bad part is, as soon as there is a lot of money involved, people obviously have a strong incentive to try to hack it. And what they do right now is they do something that's called a hard fork. They're trying to change the blockchain of Ethereum in order to get the money back from the hacker. Um, so that's actually the current status of today, but it remains to be seen whether this activity will actually be successful because they, as far as I know, will try to do it over the next one or two weeks. So this is one huge, huge application of, uh, of a smart contract, the original idea was that the people who contributed money to the DAO would vote with their tokens on projects and that Ethereum applications would be financed by the funds that were collected by the DAO. How the DAO will continue remains to be seen because of this problem that I've just described. However, I'm pretty sure that the general idea of a decentralized autonomous organization will remain, the smart contracts will improve, and that at some point we will actually see something like this. I'm not sure whether from the first day it will have this financial size that the DAO had, but I'm sure that there is a place for this, and I'm sure that over the next couple of years we will see similar types of approaches. Now, one other thing is we've mentioned R3, this bank consortium earlier. What they are doing is they are trying to create a ledger amongst them because tracking stock ownership, for example, or tracking over-the-counter trades between banks is something that requires quite a lot of legacy systems today and something that's inefficient and something you wouldn't believe that happens is sometimes stock packages simply get lost. 
because spreadsheets don't always work the way they should. And now R3 in cooperation with Chain, which is another blockchain startup, and Eris Industries, which is a service provider for blockchain applications, they are running tests in order to create uh, settlements of dead instruments on top of the blockchain. I think from the application side, this is something that's super interesting, and I believe that this is something where we will see a lot of applications in the future. Something that I'm not so sure about is whether these will be permissioned ledgers. As we said earlier, there's always a trade-off between having a permissionless ledger, which then at the same time is trustless because it's distributed, and a permissioned ledger, like in the case of R3, which requires a higher level of trust. And I think there is one analogy that, that we can look at. In the early days of the internet, you had these closed internets, if you will, like AOL, for example, the AOL network, where you couldn't just connect to it, but you needed to pay in order to get in. And this is something really similar. And it's, as we see with the internet, the open internet, which is permissionless, actually gained traction and became what we know today as the internet. And the AOL network has more or less become meaningless because everybody who was running exciting applications wanted to go to the open internet where they could get a significantly larger amount of users. So in my view, this is quite analogous to what we see here with, um, with R3. And I personally believe that open and permissionless blockchains will be the way to go. But of course, that's something where we look into the future and where we don't really know what's actually going to happen. One thing that I would recommend everybody to check out is this website, dabsethercasts.com. There's a ton of smaller Ethereum-based blockchain applications. And I think what's, what's really great about this is that they are not so huge from a financial side yet. Because this allows errors. And the errors are not as bad if they happen. There's, there's gaming applications, there's financial applications, there's derivatives. And the good thing is that you can test around and if something messes up, you don't lose as much money than if you put a million into the DAO, for example. So, in my view, it's going to take a few more years until smart contracts will be as robust that you can basically rely on it in such a way that you can also put a lot of money into it. This is a quick overview of the Bitcoin, blockchain, Ethereum startups that are already out there. And as you can see, there's a lot of them, so we couldn't cover them all today. Um, but this is something that, uh, that I'll also recommend to check out if you're generally interested in this space. This is the application layer, so this is what we have been roughly covering today. But there is also an infrastructure layer, something that we didn't talk too much yet. So for example, Eris Industries and Chain are startups that are more on the infrastructure level, that are actually helping to create infrastructure on, which, on top of which applications can be run. So, what's the conclusion of all of this? First of all, I truly believe that the blockchain as a technology is a step change because as we said at the beginning, you can run financial services and even services that go beyond financial services without banks, without legacy systems. And it's not because banks are something inherently bad. The thing is just the systems and the technology that they run is super inefficient. And when you can make yourself independent of that legacy technology, then you can potentially run way better applications. Then we've looked at payment-related blockchain applications, and these are the applications today that have already reached a lot of scale. Coinbase, for example, that we've seen earlier, that's providing merchant services and a really nice Bitcoin wallet, already has millions of users. So that's something that's not just looking into the future, that's something where we already see a lot of traction today. Bitbond, our company, we have over 38,000 registered users already today. So these are applications that already have reached a certain level of scale and that have already proven that they work quite well. Then the protocol related applications that we've looked at right now are quite early stage. And uh, I think the most innovation that we're going to see will be a combination of those two. At Bitbond, for example, we're looking at something that's uh, there is a collateralized loan where the access to the collateral, for example, could be refused or granted via the blockchain. So then we would combine not just the payments layer of the blockchain, uh, but we would additionally use the protocol layer where we would implement a smart contract 
that's related to the payments that the borrower is making. So these are the main conclusions and all in all, as I said, I think the most revolutionary thing that's always important to keep in mind is that this technology helps us to get rid of legacy systems that so far nobody could get rid of. So it's a step change and it's something where I truly believe that we are going to see a lot of changes almost maybe similar to the way we saw changes when the internet came up as a commercial phenomenon and revolutionized the way we do commerce and the way we consume media for example. So that's everything we had to say today and yeah, we yeah, stand to four right now. If you have questions, uh, happy to stick around here. Otherwise, thanks a lot for joining us. Do you care to